What does it mean to write for an academic audience? Well, the first thing to realize is that you're not just writing for your mean and nasty professor who has given you the topic. Okay, you're writing for an audience that's much more capacious than that, it's much more broad, and you can really think of your audience as a fairly educated group of people. So fairly educated, it might be your fellow classmates, it might be scholars out there, uh, but just think of, of these people as having some experience in your field, and you want to write for them, you want to educate them some more, and presumably they're going to be interested in your topic right from the start. So think not just of the topic sheet, but think of your audience as broader than that. And the first point to make then is that in your essay or in your paragraph or whatever you're writing, you should not make direct reference to the topic itself. It would be a bad move, for instance, to title your, uh, your essay Topic 1, right? Topic one. Uh, that would be very awkward. Similar, similarly, you, you would not write something like, the topic I have chosen is this. Uh, you would not make reference to the professor. You know, you, you gave me this assignment and this is what I think. So really write for a broad audience that has not seen the topic sheet. Okay, they haven't seen the topic sheet, uh, but you simply start with your topic and you assume that they're going to be somewhat interested and you can assume sort of a base level of knowledge that you can build on. And that's what we'll talk about for most of this video. What kind of base knowledge uh, can you expect? So what then might be classified as general knowledge? Well, here's an example. Let's say you wrote something like the Middle Ages the Middle Ages lasted for a thousand years. Lasted for a thousand years. And you've learned this and you want to share it. I would say that most people who have some passing familiarity with the Middle Ages would know this information already. They're not going to find this interesting and it really doesn't need to be mentioned. Uh, a similar example would be if you say something like Shakespeare wrote many plays and poems. That is so general that it's it's not going to be of interest to your, your readers. What you should assume instead is that your readers have familiarity with the topic, but they don't necessarily have an in-depth knowledge. And I'll give you an example here. Uh, let's say you're writing about Shakespeare. You know, maybe they have also read the same play as you, but they don't actually know, you know, some of the the, the hidden jokes, uh, some of the, the puns and so on. And th that's where you step in and you explain the full meaning of the lines. Okay. Uh, when it comes to literature then, just to give another example, you also don't need to define common terms. So watch out for common terms that you can assume your reader knows already. An example would be something like novella. A novella, which is something in between a short story and uh, a novel. Uh, if you're writing in economics, you could say, you could talk about communism, communism, and you can assume that your reader knows what that is. Uh, inflation, you know, there's another fairly common term. The point then is that you don't really need to define all of these common terms. You can assume that your, your readership has some familiarity with them. But of course, there are go going to be exceptions to this. And here are some examples of terms that you may want to define. Let's say you're writing a history paper and you're talking about the annexation of Austria uh, by Nazi Germany in 1938, and you use the, ter the term Anschluss. So Anschluss, okay, which refers to this annexation. Well, your readership might not be familiar with that. Um, same kind of thing with acronyms. So if you use an acronym like NATO, you can expect your, read your readers to know what that means. It's such a common acronym. But if you were to use, let's say, DDR, which refers to East Germany after the Second World War, uh, the Deutsche Demokratische uh, Republik, then maybe you want to explain that. Your readers might be like, well, what is that, <laughs> right? Maybe we need some definition. Uh, other terms that would be like this would be terms like hegemony, or as some people say, hegemony. Either of those is fine. British people are more likely to say hegemony. Um, if you use this term very broadly, then you may not need to define it. But if you're talking about the ideas of Antonio Gramsci, so Antonio Gramsci, the Italian 
communist, then maybe you do want to give a more precise definition. And I think you can start to see the, the, the point then. Uh, you can assume some familiarity, but as soon as you start to get into more depth about your topic and you use more specific terms, you may need to define them. Or, and this is the last point I'll make about common terms here, let's say you have a common term uh, like irony or paradox. Most of the time you wouldn't have to give a definition. But let's say your whole paper is about irony or paradoxes. Maybe you do want to give, give a definition because there's so much, so many different aspects of this topic that you're going to explore. And that definition is something that maybe you're going to challenge or you're going to uh, examine in more detail. And then the last point I want to make has to do with pronouns. So pronouns. When you write your essay for the, for this general audience that we've talked about, uh, you don't want to come across as too pompous. And the one thing you really want to avoid is the use of the royal we. Okay, so avoid expressions like we will argue. There's presumably just one of you writing the paper. And if that is the case, then don't use the royal we. On the other hand, you can use we in some instances when you're talking about you and the readers. If you say, for instance, we will see, then it's a little bit less pompous because it's kind of like saying, well, you and I together, we're going to see something, we're going to share an experience, uh, and that's a bit more inclusive. Now, this is still not something you should always do, okay? Uh, it may be a bit presumptive to, to speak for your reader, but it is much more allowed than the royal we, and so that's something to watch out for. Uh, in some contexts, you can use I, so in an English paper, this would be allowed, but I is often not necessary, and I is usually best reserved for cases where you want to differentiate your opinion quite sharply from somebody else's. So, for instance, if you're quoting somebody and you say, well, I disagree, that would be a place to use I. But often you can definitely do without. Okay? So if we think about audience then, the one thing to really take away from this is that your audience is quite broad, and your audience is the audience you want to be published for. So th think about yourself as trying to write that journal article that you've been reading, uh, that you're interested in and that you're quoting from, and see yourself as a scholar. And if you do that, then I think you can write uh, an effective paper that will impress people, not just your instructor, uh, but you know anybody who has an interest in the topic.